So thank you all for your patience as we are on a, a giant adventure this weekend together that I'm very excited about. Raise your hand if you are not from Detroit and you are in this room right now. So if you are from Detroit, make a new friend and tell them how great your city is. Because we're actually getting ready to go on this big adventure where we're going to be in seven neighborhoods in the next 48 hours. And so if you're from Detroit, we'd love for you to join us. Otherwise, hold on to the ride. Um, I just want to talk for a, a one brief second. My name is Ashley Sparks, and I've been the event coordinator for here in Detroit. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who have spent a lot of time with me, feeding me, taking me out on boats, hanging out in community meetings and letting me just like deeply listen. Um, this morning I woke up and I read a passage about uh, remembering what inspires you and to think about joyful exertion. And I think that this event in Detroit for me is about that. And so I just wanna ask all of us to kind of breathe in and just celebrate how amazing this beautiful city is and I just want to offer some gratitude for the folks who have really helped pull this off. Um, and the first person that I want to introduce is one of Detroit's finest poets. She is amazing and beautiful and so generous. And she is a poet, self-publisher. Uh, she's won a lot of fancy pants awards because Detroit has a lot of talent in the house. So uh, Jessica Care Moore, if you could come on up. media concert a weekend called Black Women Rock that supports women who make rock and roll music. And I make rock and roll music with poetry and uh, do a lot of stuff, work with jazz and an activist and an educator. And so I'm really, really, really happy to be here with my, my girl, DJ Stacey Hot Wax. Um, and we are preparing right now for a show because um, like, you guys are coming to Detroit, and that's fresh, and then some of us, we leave to show other people what Detroit is like. And so at uh, Purdue University is studying uh, Detroit for their fall semester. So we, me and Stacy and Antonio A.G., a.k.a. Shades, a popular graffiti artist based in Detroit, has traveled all over the world, and um, are traveling to Purdue University to do my show, The Missing Project, Pieces of the D, um, which is a show about everything I love and miss about uh, being away from Detroit and moving back and um, it's gonna be provided, uh, Underground Resistance has graciously provided us, uh, UR, which is a techno movement here in Detroit, has provided our soundtrack. And uh, yeah, it's a really beautiful show, and we're gonna be hopefully doing it in Detroit one day, but we're premiering it in Indianapolis, and we're gonna do a little piece, a uh, little piece of it for you uh, right now. So, thank you. This is about, um, I wrote this when I was young still, and I uh, just moved to New York City. It was about me being in Detroit and um, hanging out with the crew I was hanging out with, but understanding that beneath the surface I understood that if I didn't leave the crew that I was with and eventually find my way home, I might not ever end up at home. So this is for my friends from 1989. It was an unusual mix of juice and liquor with a child, her nursery rhyme name, Applejack on the rocks. We drink in the name of nighttime, bless the ground and sing, keep on moving like a love song. We scream in line for the dance, house music exercising us into ritualistic sweating on the floor. We in commune with ourselves, blow up philosophy and promise alive in a dream state never ending like mornings at Denny's. We were destined for greatness to survive, to eventually die, to deliver a message home. Can I have some more light on the paper? We had new families, a tribe of young gamblers, babies who felt old and intelligent. We fell in love with the idea of our own time never stopping up, never growing up, of having our children together, naming them after one another. How we women love them, through prisons, through drugs, through bullets, through school, through music, through parents. 
through prison, through drugs, through bullets, through school, through prison, through parents. How we found them beautiful and dangerous. Tempting reflections of who we could be if given a chance. We considered them revolutionary thinkers. I wrote poems about card games and near-death experiences. It was a new taste. Freedom from our true selves. It was a new taste. Freedom from our true selves. Red light should be random, no one's there to catch you. Red light should be random, no one's there to catch you. Steal what you can't afford. Learn to live between the crack and the sidewalk. Bury your stolen treasures there. Free France for long. Drink more liquor. Search for the God of your choice. Search for the God of your choice. Debate is an adrenaline rush. Horse-fed ride through the ghetto. Horse-fed ride through the ghetto. Master the game of chess on a marble table. Never let the music stop. Never let the music stop. Never let the music, never let the music, never let the music stop. House ain't giving up, house ain't gonna stop. Give up your house, stop. Give up your life, stop. Give up your little girl body, stop. You gotta stop giving, stop your idealism, stop giving. This has to be the last night. Stop, that's what our ancestors whispered. Stop, but we weren't speaking to no ancestors. Stop. Stop. Stop, that's what our ancestors whispered. Stop, that's what our ancestors whispered. Stop, but we weren't speaking to no ancestors. Stop, we weren't speaking to no ancestors. Stop, we got work to do. Stop, we don't live in your laws anymore. Stop college, stop heart, stop dreams. Don't give up your house, don't give up your house. Detroit has spirits. Detroit has spirits. Not just the statue in front of the Coleman and Young building to change his shirts depending on the call of the parade. We got real time spirits and ancestor spirits. All of them protect this city, stand as guardian. Our historians have names by coffee at Avalon, still eat Coney dogs at Lafayette, or the Detroit Red at Detroit Beer Company. Go to Woodbridge for the Black Bean Burger and enjoy the dark lights at the Union Street. Value the Cass Cafe. Detroit, it's easy. Into French and South African apartheid and the Berlin Wall crumbling down, Jewish and African Holocaust, black men in Italian suits, Derek May in shades, live at the Torino Music Festival, on the road, stop. Even with Motown left, even with Motown left, we never let the music stop. We never let the music stop. Never let the music, never let the music, never let the music stop. In Cuba, in Italy, in New York, in Atlanta, we never let the music stop. In South Africa, I left my heart in Soweto. In the brick and panels of wood painted red, I read poems about US sponsored apartheid and gave young South African girls my own interpretation of New York's Statue of Liberty. I saw joy rush through their veins, colored in Soweto. Mississippi got damn black in Soweto. Everybody in my family, my friends in Detroit looked like somebody in Soweto. Linton Crazy Johnson wore the most beautiful hats and spoke about madness in Joburg and Cape Town and Durban. They called me Mama Champ. We love you, Mama Champ. The mothership has landed in Mandela's home. Mojo told us to hold on tight, don't let go, and we didn't. I was here when he spoke to a sold-out crowd in a different Detroit, Tiger Stadium, 1990, on the road in Scotland, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in Morocco, flying home from Morocco. Me, my husband, Abby Lincoln, and her trio lost the right engine of a plane. We too close to the water. We too close to the water. I heard it in French. I catch pieces of Arabic. We ain't supposed to be seeing those boats. We gotta turn around. The plane's got more engines. The pilot said it in English. We are trapped at a table with European American tourists. We know Abby Lincoln is a queen, is jazz diva. Don't say nothing stupid. We too low to the water. We on the ground now. New plane in the morning. What kind of poems you write? Abby Lincoln asked. A Mary Baraka kind of poem. Sonia Sanchez type poem. She smiles. It's comfortable. Please don't ask. Just sip the soup and eat the couscous. They don't. They can't. They lean in. They ask. So, are you a singer? Who brought you to Morocco? She shifts. She is second from excusing herself. She answers, the king and the queen, then leaves. Rest in peace, Abby Lincoln. Rest in peace, Abby Lincoln. In Berlin, the German man grabs my arm after my performance in front of thousands of people in Potsdamer Flats and says, it's a shame they don't love or appreciate you in your own country. It's a shame they don't love and appreciate you in your own city. Never let the music stop. Never let the music stop. Remember who you are. 
you buzz a lot of, no, I'm Americana, you buzz a lot of, in my ear, no, I'm Americana, stop pretending you understand your experience, drink the medicine with sugar, the aftertaste is better, afterlife is better, live through the music, watch your turn, girl, watch your mouth, brother, this is a rice of passage, how, this is a choosing time, how, now everyone gets to go, now, everyone survives, baby, eat the pain, love, eat the pain, love, eat the pain, love, just don't give up your house, don't give up your house, go home, sister, follow your spirit there, just go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, 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 stop.
some, uh, some funding support that we got that's just allowing this to happen came from the National Endowment for the Arts, came from uh, the National Performance Network, NPN, in, the, in, uh, in New Orleans, and uh, locally from the Kresge Foundation, who, uh, who believed in this project and uh, was a big supporter of getting us here and, uh, and for the entire cycle. And lastly, it's the, the contributions, the work, the support of our members. We're a member organization, and a lot of people do a lot of work. They show up, they participate, and they're the ones that make it happen. So thank you to all of these individuals. Thank you to you all. Lastly, I know that we're running kind of late, and so I don't want to stand up here and talk, uh, uh, but I do just want to make sure that I give some context to, uh, to what we're doing this weekend. Um, so uh, part of what, we, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're a lot of ensemble theaters, and many of our members, many, much of this work happens in and with community. It, it is people who belong to ensembles are members of their community, and it got us to think about the relationship between place and art and how does art impact place, and how does place impact art? And so that's one of the things that we're looking at over the course of the weekend. The big central question we're asking is, how does art impact your community? And so over the, over the weekend, we're gonna be asking that question. We're gonna be looking at the work, at the impact that artists and, and cultural workers have on communities, and how uh, cross-sector, how different organizations are working together to make a difference, um, to, to address the pressing challenges, the pressing needs. Uh, of, of a community. And so that's the work that we'll be looking at over the course of the weekend. We're asking um, four big questions, uh, uh, kind of lenses that we'll, that we'll ask. How does art impact place? How does art, uh, how does place impact art? What does this work look like? And how does this work work? So, so those are some of the questions that we'll be asking. We'll be looking at something to keep in the back of your minds as you go through the weekend. Um, so, uh, so that, that is that uh, a component of this event is that we have a, what we're calling a fellowship program. Uh, two people from each of the four communities I listed are going to be attending each and every one of these events. And they're going to be working, they're going to be looking at what's going on, uh, we're going to be supporting the work that they do in their own home communities. It was a way for NET to give back to our hosts. Uh, who give us so much, and this is a way to, for us to do something in return. Uh, so we have eight, uh, seven of our eight cohorts here. So uh, if cohorts, if you could just raise your hand or stand up, uh, if you're already standing. So we got a few over there, we have some over there. Um, yeah. um, look out, these individuals may come up and start talking to you, they may start asking questions uh, uh, and engage with them, because uh, they're here working, they're here, uh, so that we can do can this work more, do this better. The last group I just want to, to acknowledge, people who are in the house that are, that are, that are uh, also do a lot for us, is our board of directors. Uh, so if you're a NET board member, can you stand up or raise your hand if you're already standing? NET board members. Yeah. So thank you. Um, great, great, great. So, uh, so those are things I just want to make sure uh, we got said, that got stated at the top. Uh, this is a weekend long event. Some of you are just here for tonight. Uh, that's cool. Some of you might want to come and join us for the weekend. So uh, you're invited and you're welcome. We're going to be all over the city. So, uh, uh, so join us. Uh, and the weather, thank you Detroit. Uh, we're rolling out your finest. Um, so Ashley, I think we're ready to move on. Yes? Yep. So, uh, so should I just stop, do that introduction? See, this is all happening live here. So, uh, so we're gonna start this all off with, uh, with this panel. Uh, uh, Dan Kincaid, uh, who is with uh, Rogue HAA. And uh, so I wanna invite Dan and the panelists who are gonna join us for this next piece to come on up. Uh, Dan and panelists, come on up. Welcome. <laughs>
Yeah, okay. So, I'm not sure if this is... technological challenges in front of us, but that's pretty much part of the course whenever we do these things. And I'm sorry, I'm standing right in front of you guys, so I'll back up in a second, I promise. Um, I have to tell you though, honestly, I'm incredibly intimidated to be up here right now. Um, I'm pretty, I'm just a humble architect who's uh, standing in a space with stage lights and there's spoken word things going on and theatrical people. And, uh, so, um, a little intimidating, maybe some of my guests share that same feeling, but anyway, I do. So, uh, before we um, uh, get to the, uh, uh, to the presentation we have, I thought I would um, just kind of expand a little bit on who, who I am and who we are within Rogue HEA. So, um, uh, I'm an architect at, at Hamilton Anderson Associates, and in that firm we actually developed um, a group called Rogue HEA, so it's the, the acronym for Hamilton Anderson at the tail end there, and it's really a group that's a kind of design collaborative that's intended to kind of fuel uh, extensive conversation in the community about design to raise a level of discourse and also to impact the way in which design um, interacts with our lives within, within the city. So an event like this for us is, is, is kind of right on the money and quite, um, quite stimulating for us because it really begins to connect a lot of the dots um, that we try to work with uh, every day in our, in our own practice. So um, before we get into it a little bit further also, I, um, I wanted to just extend some, some thank yous as well, although we just went through a round of them, but to, to Mark Valdez and, and Ashley and Franny and Gwen and all the folks here who have made this possible. Um, they've done it from a, from a distance for, for quite a while and have been really helpful with us to, to get things together and, and we really do appreciate that. And, and even though it's, they're part of the, the network of ensemble theaters, um, they've assured me that um, even though we're not very theatrical people, we're, we're supposed to be here. I'm still trying to figure that out, but uh, bear with us. So imagine this is like its own little performance or something, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, we'd also like to thank all of you for being here too. We know, you know there's other places to be and we know there's a lot going on this weekend. Galleries are opening, uh, the African World Festival is starting, there's a lot happening. So we do appreciate you being here. Um, and, and before we go, uh, I also want to um, thank Mickey Sada, who's behind the computer here, who actually just got this thing working. Thank you. Uh, without Mickey, actually, none of this would happen here either. So I, I really appreciate all, all you've done. Thank you very much. Um, and lastly, I want to thank our panelists. Um, they've volunteered their time tonight to be with us. We're very appreciative of that. They're busy, and uh, we're just happy to have them with us. We have uh, starting here uh, Philip Laurie, creator of Detroit Lives. Um, Yelka Ellison with Eastern Market over here, and we have Oya Amakisi here with uh, US, U.S. Social Forum and a few other, uh, the leader of a film festival and a number of the things that you're going to share with us, and also Mike Khan here with Street Culture Mash. So each, yeah, <laughs> exactly. so each person who's on the panel here represents obviously a different kind of perspective on how arts and, and creative practice begins to engage uh, the city. You can start to see and, and kind of triangulate the different lines that exist here. And that's really what we're trying to, uh, trying to explore tonight. Um, this is really a, a conversation about, um, it is about cities, it's about art and creativity, it's about development, it's about authenticity, passion, struggle, uh, and, and uh, above all, all facets of, of development, how it weaves into our lives. Um, and it's really about what happens when all these aspects actually collide, uh, and how they can actually take um, a, a national narrative on what's happening with things like this in other cities and actually begin to, to draw it through the lens within, within Detroit and determine how it actually translates. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a quick preamble and then we're going to get into it, I promise. So historically, the role of art within the development or revitalization of cities has been seen as, uh, cynically at times, as one of unwitting accomplice to gentrification and a complicit partner to the exploitation of creative capacity. Uh, in this interpretation, art exists only for a moment as a noble avant-garde, free of encumbrances, 
before becoming instrumentalized by, by the very elements it actually sought to move beyond. From past examples such as uh, Soho in Manhattan, uh, Southwark in London, or even contemporary examples in, in places like Over the Rhine in Cincinnati, uh, you can see where leading edge artists um, and other creative types begin to give way to something that's potentially more banal actually than the squalor and disinvestment that had uh, previously existed and, and ultimately actually undermine uh, the diverse array of, of creative folks who actually got things going to, to begin with. So this is a story we know well. It's not necessarily a story or, or, or a, a narrative that we talk about a lot within Detroit because we do see we do see uh, art as being somehow always and always in the positive, and I think we're we're trying to look at that and, and investigate that a little bit more tonight and see what happens when we go further down the road. Um, so what if the what if the, the um, art and other creative forces in Detroit could could overcome um, what seems to be a predetermined path? Could the enormity of our challenges here in Detroit um, actually be addressed? And and could, could the collective resolve that we have here and our, our unique ability to kind of integrate a blend of artists and designers and other allied prep professionals actually bridge a gulf that's contributed to really the punchline that results from so many other cities when they get kind of sanitized, if you will? Uh, and, and how might all of these groups actually leverage the knowledge base from one another to affect change, uh, retain the integrity of their intellectual projects, and create a new model for collaboration that actually contradicts the implicit Dar Darwinistic growth regime model that so many uh, actually attribute to quote unquote revitalization in capitalist economies. So five years down the road, can we actually sustain an event like this in this space with all with everybody here, right? Without paying tens of thousands of dollars to do so. Um, so, you know, rather than just talking about uh, how great creativity is in general, which I think we all would agree uh, that it is in this room, um, we want to talk a little bit more about um, you know, what happens after all the good stuff that's going on in Detroit actually comes to fruition, right? And, and things really start clicking even more. Um, what happens to, to the voices that actually got us here? Um, and, and how can we make sure that we can actually somehow arrest a potential decline and actually keep things moving in a more creative uh, creative way? So um, I think it's, it's particularly a poignant question uh, for a lot of us here on the panel and for, for me as a, as a practicing designer. Um, that, you know, as many of us work to actually create a, a Detroit that's more sustainable, uh, attractive, and competitive, uh, with a higher quality of life, uh, which everybody would like to attain in the city, um, are we actually losing something along the way? Uh, and so how do we actually uh, balance that out? So uh, thank you, and forgive me for that very long intro that I won't get to out there. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. So uh, what we want to do first is actually bring up Philip Laurie. Um, he's going to share some stuff with us here. Um, uh, Philip is, is a social entrepreneur uh, with experience in sourcing and creative marketing firms in Chicago and Portland. Uh, Laurie returned to his hometown here in Detroit in 2008 uh, to start a creative agency uh, called Detroit Lives. Many of you have already seen this online and, and uh, probably frequent the site regularly. Um, <laughs> When not uh, tackling a project, uh, he'll take every chance to jump on a plane to Columbia or to sit on the couch with a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So, with that, maybe we'll start off with oh, keeping you this if you want to. Thanks. Um, okay, so I have 30 seconds each slide, if that works. Okay. Um, so, Detroit Lives, uh, creative agency, social brand. What does that mean? Um, the creative agency side is, is a little bit easier. Uh, we take on clients in film production, print, and motion graphics. Um, but then the social branding side is a little more exciting, whereby we use those skills to create a variety of different things in the city. Uh, public art, uh, we produced a feature length uh, documentary. Um, we have a clothing line, paper goods, things like that, uh, that overall begin to uh, utilize a, a variety of different multimedia assets to reposition the perception of the city. Um, uh, just some clients that we've done stuff for that you might have seen things. So uh, we work with Skidmore, the Detroit Great Corridor Center, Midtown, and blah, blah, blah. Next slide. Um, now, this is uh, just some snapshots of, of work that, uh, again, perhaps you've seen uh, that we've developed online, uh, maybe on Facebook or Twitter or on our site, that's right, Next slide. 
Um, now, social branding, again, uh, what are we talking about here? I was saying street art. Well, how does that actually work? Um, so, so things like painting uh, positive message-based murals on you know, enormous you know, walls throughout the city that people commute by every day. Well, you know, how does that actually have an effect? Um, you know, we'd like to believe that, that public art, you know, in general, uh, encourages the growth of the community that it serves, but then also, uh, depending on how you position it, it can have effect on the people that pass by. Um, branded merchandise, things like uh, shirts and posters that sort of use the word Detroit Live so that, you know, people are putting it on their walls and, you know, somebody walks in and they say, what, what, what do you mean? That's not what I've heard. Uh, and so like, it, it, it ignites a, a story about something in particular that's near and dear to their heart. Um, so other things, filmmaking, we, we're, we're currently uh, touring, uh, screening across the country and through Europe, a uh, film called After the Factory. Uh, it premiered uh, at the DIA uh, this past February, and it's a, it's a documentary that looks at solutions for post-industrial cities through Detroit in a very similarly positioned city in Poland called Wuj. Uh, Wuj was an enormous uh, manufacturer of textiles. When communism was dismantled, the industry collapsed and left in its way many of the same conditions that we see here in Detroit. So the film kind of takes a hopeful look at what comes after the factory, and it's coming through the people in these places that are doing, you know, that are answering that question. Um, all in all, it's about rethinking social advocacy um, and how media and multimedia engages people and how. Um, different forms of, of media development can collide to create these outcomes that perhaps we don't fully understand and sometimes we can't even chart. Um, and so with that, uh, I will give the mic to the next person. Thank you very much. Oh, and that's just some, some pictures of, of stuff. We're building a race car track in, uh, on a vacant lot at the Georgia Street Community Garden. Um, that was the, uh, oh hell, I had more slides than I thought. <laughs> and it's too soon. Um, yeah, so if you go back one slide, sorry. Uh, so upper left, we're building this remote control race car track on a vacant lot at, uh, at the Georgia Street Community Garden. Uh, kids will earn uh, car time by volunteering and working with uh, the neighborhood collective that is our own place. We've got a mural on the lower left, snapshot on the website in the middle, uh, a, a t-shirt in the lower right, uh, a screen grab from the film, things like that. Uh, next slide is just uh, kind of the future of the company, so obviously growing our client base and continuing uh, to weave this Detroit narrative into commercial work and stuff that people are hiring us for. Um, and so in effect, to kind, of, to kind of change the narrative, to change the perception. Um, and then flex those social advocacy muscles and, and sort of engage people with the city in ways that they didn't expect to create these undesired, wonderful outcomes. Thank you. Uh, can you guys see the screen okay? No. no. Okay. Oh, tell me now. <laughs> All right, start over. Um, okay, so we, we won't start over, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll step back slightly. Uh, so, so our, our next, um, actually, before we go, uh, just so you know, what we're going to do is have each one of the panelists present a little bit about what they do, and then we're actually going to come back around and ask a couple questions. We're going to throw it out to the audience so everybody here can ask them questions. Uh, that's what this is leading to. I didn't reveal that earlier on. Uh, so uh, our, our next uh, panelist is Yelka Ellison. She works at the uh, Eastern Market Corporation, um, and uh, uh, which is a perfect combination of her love for cities and development with her background in finance. Returning to Detroit last summer, uh, after living for 10 years in Los Angeles, uh, has been everything that she was hoping for and more. Uh, originally from Czechoslovakia, Yelva continues to be amazed by her journey from Eastern Europe to Eastern Market. <laughs>
And um, like I said, it's one of the last functioning uh, food districts. It has not been developed into an entertainment district or a loft district. <laughs> and uh, this, this, this preservation of use is what we uh, are focusing on mostly these days. Next, please. So we are a regional food hub. What does that mean? That means that food uh, gets sold, gets processed, gets redistributed around here. This creates an immense uh, economic engine for the district as well as for the surrounding neighborhoods. As a regional food hub, we make sure that all the elements of the food uh, processing system is aligned. And like I mentioned, we are very lucky that if you look at the if you look at this map, the um, majority of the uses here are still uh, food related. And thank you. Um, so I work for Eastern Market Corporation. Uh, apart from running the retail and the wholesale market, we also serve as a district development engine and a community development engine. Um, from the previous map, you can see that to the west uh, there's a the freeway. To the south, there is a freeway. So uh, <laughs> the, our neighborhood, our community is mostly to the east of us. So we are in the business of making sure that others stay in business. Uh, and these others are our customers. They're not necessarily the people who come here on Saturday for the retail market. They are the sellers at the market. And we group them into three clusters. Next, please. They are the growers. The growers can be uh, a multi-generational farm from across the state whose family has been coming here from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. It can be a person who has been growing uh, produce in one of the over 1400 community farms in Detroit and they sell in form of a call at the market. Or it can be this newest class um, of specialty food vendors. So your pickles, your pierogies, your sausages. This is, this is a really exciting group that um, has blossomed at the market. Next, please. So the second cluster is um, street vendors. Uh, these guys are uh, embodied a true entrepreneurial spirit. They are there rain and shine, summer, winter, selling socks and incenses and, and posters and sports equipment. Um, they are part of a somewhat gray economy. They are not our official vendors. They don't pay us stall fees. But at the same time, we kind of strive to get them engaged in the conversation about the development of the market. Um, and we try very hard not to disturb this authenticity they bring to the market while trying to do infrastructure improvements because we are talking about buildings and roads and sidewalks that are 100 years old or more. And um, it's, it's it's not easy. Uh, and the third group is the artists. So um, art is understood differently by different groups. So one of the negative side effects of artists moving into the district is the increased maintenance costs for us in terms of graffiti removal. Um, however, as an opportunity, how to turn this problem into an opportunity? Uh, we came up with an idea, next please, for something called a street art fest where we would love to engage our community, which is the business community, the building owners and business owners, together with the artists, the taggers, and also the builders, the architects, the designers, and A, create teams that would, that would just make beautiful heroes <laughs> throughout the market, that hopefully the people participating and working on them would respect that they wouldn't be tagging them. And also, if anybody um, in the building community would offer advice in sort of a clinic, you know, for to the building owners in terms of structural improvements or maybe aesthetic improvements. And that way, get all of these groups that right now might not be communicating very effectively involved and, and feel ownership of this process and make the market, the district that much healthier. So, um, like I mentioned, the artists are moving in the district. I think this has to do with the authenticity of, of Eastern Market. The authenticity is something that, in my opinion, is very highly valued in Detroit. And it is still something that we are threatened to lose. 
because we are primarily a food district. So in the last two years, we have had a number of galleries open on Crash. We have a number of, um, on the prior slide, you can see a vintage leather printing shop. We actually have two of those in the district. We have these amazing collaborative hacker spaces. And uh, how do we, you know, how do we, we understand gentrification in terms of displacement, displacement of uses. So how do we preserve our character as a functioning food district while trying to make it complete. And, and that's the challenge that comes with, next please. You know, we have semi-trucks driving around here between midnight and 5 a.m. during the week. We have smaller houses. We have really loud, what might be called obnoxious uses. <laughs> and how do you balance this with, with this creative class that wants to be here, that wants to be part of the experience? The, the coffee shops, you know, the the, the boutiques, uh, also helping existing uh, business owners make their businesses more profitable, better, more in the 21st century. So um, we understand art is something that adds value, and adding value and therefore creating opportunities doesn't have to be just. A, can you go back, please? Thank you. Thank you. Doesn't have to be. Back, uh, I mean, for yeah. It doesn't have to be a piece of art, a sculpture, or painting. It can be also a public asset. So just to the east of you, such a public asset exists. It's called the Quinter Cut, and it's a below grade former rail line. It was converted into a bike path that connects the riverfront. And right now, that ends at Dreshet, which is this big street behind us. We have been lucky with uh, a number of other organizations to get an award of $10 million from the uh, Department of Transportation to connect uh, the Quinder Cut. This would be phase two, and then uh, connected and linked to other parts of Detroit. So uh, the phase two of the Quinder Cut has buildings coming all the way down to the trail, which presents an amazing uh, real estate development opportunity and again, creating value and creating uh, creating ways how to maybe channel the and spill the artistic energy from Eastern Market District more into the Quinder Cut. Because if you haven't walked it before, uh, the landscape people, the graffiti people, the exercise people, everybody will find something there that will that, that comes together in a really nice harmony. So. Um, like I mentioned, uh, there's an immense opportunity for residential development. This is something that we as Eastern Market Corporation are constantly talking and discussing and being asked to do. And we feel that um, doing it in a way that, um, <laughs> doing it in a way that creates complete district is what we want to definitely um, encourage. Because we talk about complete streets where you have a lot of users that might be separated, you know, people in cars, people on bikes, people walking, and they all learn how to coexist. So we wanna, we wanna have a complete district. We wanna have a place where you can have the food businesses, you can have the processing uh, areas, you can have the restaurants, you can have the artists, and you can have people living. And next, please. So to this end, we're working on uh, rewriting our regulatory framework. We are actually proposing a, an overlay zone for the market, and you can see kind of the blue is the market, the red is kind of a shoe, uh, horseshoe shape that would be the commercial. The purple is more kind of the, the more intense uses, the more industrial area, and orange to the side is the residential. So another way that we are working on increasing values uh, on the near east side, thanks please, um, is by creating sustainable mechanisms, whether it's natural, such as uh, unearthing this creek, it's called Bloody Run Creek, that uh, winds throughout most of east side of Detroit, or financing mechanisms. Um, we would like to develop a tax increment finance district in Eastern Market that would be a great tool to encourage development but also to then connect it to other, other projects such as the, such as the Bloody Run Creek. Um, so I hope that those of you who don't know much about Eastern Market, this 
make you aware it's more than just a place where you come on Saturdays to buy your fruits and vegetables <laughs> and get bloody various of videos. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I find it a really, really interesting place because in uh, Michigan, the, the agricultural tradition is very, um, very fresh in the minds of people. It's not too long ago that somebody's grandfather had a farm and sold at the market, and I think Michigan is really special in this way. We have the second largest crop diversity after California, but unfortunately we are nowhere near there in terms of uh, food processing jobs. So food is a great job generating factor. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, so we're going we're gonna to move forward here. Um, Oya Makisi is with us, and um, she's an activist, artist, and an educator. Um, she uses art as a tool to heal, educate, and empower the community on a local, national, and international level. Oya is the founder and director of Detroit Women of Color International Film Festival. She also served as a chair. She also served as the chair of the Cultural Working Group and served as the Detroit representative for 2010 United States Social Forum. Oya Makisi. Peace, everyone. So this is an old flyer from the Detroit Women of Color International Film Festival. It was actually held in Easter Market at Johansson Charles Gallery. I started the film festival because we have amazing film community here in Detroit, but the voices of women of color in particular were absent in the conversation. And so um, as I began to work with um, artists across the country, um, my first film was No, the Rape Documentary by Aisha Simmons. Uh, it discussed um, interracial rape within the black community. And I brought together um, panelists and healers and um, health workers and brothers and sisters who were survivors of rape. And I didn't have any money. I don't have $10 million or um, funders or anyone. It came out of my pocket, but it also came out of the pocket of the community. I went to churches, I went to men's groups, I went to women's groups, and people gave. And so that's how it happened. And what I noticed was when we showed the film, people were calling me in tears because no one, they had never told anyone that they had been raped. They had never talked about their experiences, their challenges. And when we came together as a community, it was an audience of men and women of all ages. And they opened up in a way that I've never seen before because the film allowed them through the stories of others to feel comfortable to tell their own stories. And so when this happened, we, we went into this deep dialogue that continued even after the film. And I was like, okay, now we gotta do something more with this. And so the Detroit Women of Color International Film Festival evolved from there. Um, we're going into our fourth year this year. The last two years I took off to do the United States Social Forum and I also uh, work with the World Social Forum. Now, the United States Social Forum came here in 2010, and let me tell you, um, I was insane. <laughs> when I look at the level of work that I was involved with during the Social Forum, it kind of blows my mind, because when you're in the flow, um, you just, you don't stop. And so it was non-stop work, and eventually I burned out, but that's another conversation. Um, so the goal of the United States, so can we go back one, please? So the goal of the United States Social Forum um, was to bring grassroots um, organizations, NGOs, or any progressive group, any activists who want to create change in the world. And so uh, our model was the World Social Forum, and they kept challenging us in the United States. So what are you going to do? Because you're in the belly of the beast. So what are you going to do other than just come to the conference and have these conversations? And so um, Grassroots Global Justice and many other organizations got together um, and tried it in, um, in 2007 in Atlanta. And so they were looking for a new, 
spot. And so Detroit stepped up because we're like, if you want to know how to battle the beast, come to Detroit. If you want to know how to survive, come to Detroit. It was at a time where uh, the, the economic bubble had burst and the illusions of the middle class were no longer there. People had to deal with the realities of gentrification, of privatization, deregulation, um, and a more conservative government that was not meeting the needs of the people. We're not even talk about war and other issues that we were dealing with, immigration, violence in our community, and economic violence, which we call poverty. And so here in Detroit was a wonderful example of how no matter what they tell us, we really want to survive. And so come here to Detroit if you want to know how to do something better with your lives. We're not here waiting for someone to come and save us. We never know. And so the United States Social Forum came here. I represented it. We went across the country. We represented the United States Social Forum and worked with 34 countries around the world. It was a challenge. Um, the opening ceremony itself, we led it with the indigenous community because we want to honor the voice of the people who are denied a voice. They are important and they matter. We have art from all many, from many different aspects that were in there. We had about 10,000 people who walked through Woodward all the way up to Cobo Hall. Next slide. So the music performances, I was the head of culture. Um, we had Heart Plaza, which I hope some of you go to see if you're from out of town. It's a beautiful space. We had two stages. Um, we also had a children's art village. We had an um, art gallery in the basement area of the Heart Plaza. In addition to that, we had an um, a artist lab in Cobo Hall. In addition to that, we had a film festival that was held in another spot. And it was hard because we had, we were a border city. So we had to deal with the Detroit Police Department, um, Homeland Security, and immigration. And it was a challenge um, every day. But people like uh, Jessica Care Moore, who stepped up to the plate and supported the United States Social Forum and represented Detroit. We had people like John Trudell, uh, Sonny Patterson, so many amazing artists from around the world. We had an artist who just showed up. Yeah, I'm coming from Ecuador, so uh, could you give me a room? <laughs> And so it was just, it was a powerful situation, and art was springing up spontaneously in the streets and at Cobo Hall. It was a part of the PMA, the People Movement Assembly, and the plenaries. And my goal was to make sure that art was incorporated into every aspect of the movement, because art moves the movement. It's the voice of the people, the poetry, the music, the dance, and we'll show you some examples of other ways that art can be used to transform um, through social justice. Next slide, please. So this is the, the film festival that we held um, there. And this is an example of um, Oliver Stone's film, South of the Border. We have representatives from Brazil, Ecuador, um, and Argentina uh, who spoke on a panel to talk about the role of social justice and leadership in South America and the Caribbean. It was so crowded that people, you can't see it here, but people actually laid on the stage and looked up at the screen because they were so determined to be a part of that conversation. It was life-changing. And it's interesting because as an organizer, I didn't get to participate in this. <laughs> I just made it happen with other dedicated artists who were determined to make sure that we have another tool to express ourselves beyond corporate media. Okay, next one, please. This is the Children's Social Forum, AJ um, Downey and many others, Elizabeth Whitaker and many others played a key role in making sure that our children are always represented because you start early. Every aspect of their lives should be filled with joy and beauty, no matter what's happening around them, and love. Artists are trying to make that happen. And so at the Children's Art Village, it was amazing and beautiful. Um, matter of fact, we even had one of the largest powwows in North America at the United States Social Forum. We had representatives from all over the United States and from Canada. Next slide, please. This is the Cultural Arts Lab, and it was amazing. Artists from around the country started contacting me, and they said, well, we need a space for the artists just to come together and work together and build. 
And so over 500 artists will come through this space and collaborate and also utilize this as a way um, for the puppets that were part of the opening ceremonies, a part of the protests that we had throughout the city. Uh, we also have work brigades where people came from around the country to come and volunteer in the city of Detroit and guards. Detroit has over 1,500 community gardens and um, farms here. And so we, we invited people to come and work and help with building up the city. But we had to make sure that they understood, once again, you're not coming to save us. You're coming to work with us and be a part of this. And how do we learn from each other? How do we build with each other? And that's one of the greatest lessons of the social form, is how do we honor each other's presence, each other's work, and how do we create the change that we want to see in this world beyond just the conversation? Next slide, please. Uh, Detroit expanded. There are many people who couldn't come to the social forum due to economics, transportation, immigration issues. It was kind of a hot time. We, we had to deal with some people. Um, they tried to deport. Um, and so um, I worked with a team. Um, I led this. And so we set up hubs all around the world. We have hubs in Japan and Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Senegal. Um, you name it, it was all over the world where they actually set up like screenings. Um, and we, we did a live stream of the events that happened at the social forum. And we actually interacted with each other. So it was a tool for us to stay connected around the world with people who could not be there. Next slide. This is an example of some of the work that was done in the Creativity Lab. We created these beautiful, um, um, pieces of uh, art that we took throughout the city to challenge the Detroit incinerator that's causing um, health problems within our community, that's, that's poisoning our children, causing high levels of asthma, um, depleting the, the neighborhood. And so people came out from all over the country. And not only did they have these beautiful signs, but they sang songs, they had concerts, and they challenged them. And people were like, we never had a protest like that before. Like, yeah, it's Detroit. <laughs> so this is a part of how you can incorporate art into every aspect of things that you do. Next slide, please. This is an example of the guards that we're going to be starting. So um, I work with a part of brothers and sisters here in Detroit. I have a team of sisters that I'm working with. We're going to do neighborhood um, gardens where we restore the neighborhood, that we also have live concerts, film showings. Uh, people are going to come together and have community meetings along with creating healthy foods for themselves, empowering them and teaching them how to take care of it for themselves, providing jobs, and also teaching them how to eat healthier and work together and to restore our neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, so these are all open uh, to the public, and they were 
uh, funded initially by uh, 323 East and uh, Street Culture Match, we put this on uh, because they're just sitting there. <laughs> Um, and so it, it, it evolved, you know, and we, we, we worked with over 35 different artists, we participated in the uh, Detroit Design Festival, so designers, um, and people of all sort of, you know, walks, and uh, these are a couple of uh, New York based artists, um, and then we've, uh, of course, you know, worked with, um, the, the very first slide was uh, some of the best graffiti artists from Detroit, Kobe Solomon, and um, and Fell 3000. Um, and so this project, um, we, we saw it as a great opportunity, but we understood that it was a temporary one, um, that these were commercial spaces that we were never going to get to really, really play in, you know, and, and make an impact then. Um, and so we, we wanted to, you know, we create a lot of content um, and, and try to tell stories for um, these people and, and help market um, the, the talent that's here. Um, and so one example um, of this is an artist called Mello. Um, he's um, a local emerging artist. Um, so we did this piece for him and got him a commissioned um, little piece with vitamin water. And so it's like 55 seconds. Um, the music is by uh, Pasquala. And uh, so everything Detroit made, produce, artists, the whole bit.
concepts are sort of the last thing um, that we might want to share with you. It's a project that we're doing for the fall. Um, it's in um, it's in the suburbs, and uh, it's actually Gross Point. And so this is not really a Gross Point sort of image, but uh, we, <laughs> we we have a home that we're gonna um, that we get free reign uh, to do what we please as it's going to be demolished. And so we're gonna showcase um, a lot of great talent here um, in the space. You know that's untraditional, um, and then couple that with um, a, a sustainable sushi concept, and so pairing you know, two types of ephemeral art together. So we, we hope you can you know, maybe make that out in the fall, so that's, that's okay. Thank you.
all the time. It's not someone, once again, coming to save us. So when we talk about beauty, let's talk about the beauty that already exists if we're going to talk about working together. For instance, with the graffiti artists, we're talking about the, the abandoned houses as well, Michigan Welfare Rights and other organizations are taking over abandoned homes and putting homeless people in them because I need a place to stay. You can buy that. Let's work together in that way. And I'm trying to find ways, and we're going to talk about building Detroit. Let's talk about the whole of Detroit and the people who have lived here all their lives and invested in sacrifice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, 
I think a lot of there's a lot of cross pollination occurring, and, and just in general, as we look at the arts, we're seeing um, various art forms coming together to create things that maybe we didn't expect. And, and I think let's use this as an opportunity. Um, to, there, there are people coming from out of town for this festival. There's obviously that festival going on. I, I think you know it's what's been done has been done, and we can look at it as, as a problem. But we can also try to maybe create some situations where where because these two festivals are happening at the same time, you know, we create outcomes that, that nobody really expected. Um, Neither is the same. Anybody have uh, another question? Make tomorrow about that. Does anybody have another question? Yeah. Sure. I don't know. Go for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, what, what, what I'm finding really uh, interesting and, and feel appreciative of is the fact that the four of you um, have shared the stories of your individual work as a part of communities here in Detroit, um, and that also in this conversation we're trying to, I guess, look for linkages in terms of how the different projects and bodies of work you do connect to larger efforts here in the city. And it feels like right now in the last five or seven minutes, we've started to, you know, here we are, like some of us have been in town for eight hours. First time I've ever been to Detroit in my life. And I'm really excited to be here. For Chicago, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, and so I'm excited to, of course, hear complicated conversation that, that resonate with me as someone who lives in Chicago, but I'd also love the opportunity to maybe hear from the four of you. Um, you have an audience here of a lot of folks who do arts-based organizing and activity in different parts of the country. What are the challenges that you find yourself facing here in Detroit that you would love to say to the rest of us, here's some things we're learning here. Here's some things we're struggling with here. Here's some things we have no idea how we're going to move forward, but here are the questions that we're asking as we try to move forward. Because I, I would love to hear that, particularly in a room where the complications are clearly here. They're not all worked out. But what are the questions that you want to say? Here's some questions that we hope when you return to the work you're doing that you keep in mind because they're questions that resonate here and that are challenging here. Well, um, one of the issues is, as we have this conversation about gentrification, let's talk about who gets funded and who doesn't. Where they get funded and where they don't get funded. Let's talk about bridge. <laughs> so we can have, you know, so in terms of racism, it's very, it's alive and well. Um, the Detroit and the suburbs here, you know, we're still very much dealing with issues of equity of respect of, um, of, of a state government who's at war with the city, trying to take it over at the same time that we're struggling to survive. So as artists, not only are we dealing with making sure that our art gets out there, but how do we survive in this? And so they're even talking about restructuring the city and deciding which areas get funded. And you still have to pay taxes, no matter where you're at. Right. But certain areas get funded, certain areas get police support, certain areas get support from the ambulances or whatever, and the list goes on, and then some don't. I've, I've lived in places where you can call the police, Indian Village, they come three minutes. I've lived on Lauder and Fecal area, and they may or may not come. No matter what you say, somebody could be dead in the middle of the street. And so we have to talk about the reality that art is not separate from the people who live there in our situations. And so in every, every city is different. But once again, in Detroit, racism is real. And so certain artists, if you're with the flow, sometimes you get paid, sometimes you don't. But if you challenge the system often, you don't get paid. You have to find creative ways to make that happen. That means how do we build with each other? How do we, how do we have self-determination where we're not dependent upon fun foundations to validate our art and our, our work in our own communities? And so that's, that's an aspect that we can talk about that I think about on a regular basis because that's what I do. I was going to say, And this is um, Dream Hampton, and she's a um, filmmaker, writer,
one of the facilitators, so I'll be on a track tomorrow when we go to Yusuf Shakur's place. Something you just said, like, just fucked me up, you know? My, um, it's real, my, you know, my dad, it took, he had a heart attack, and it took 20 minutes for the ambulance to get there. And, well, 29 minutes. If it had gotten there in the 20th minute, he would have lived. And that was six years ago. And so it's, it's very real. My, I lived, I grew up on the east side of Detroit. I lived in New York for 20 years. I just came home. I lived in Brooklyn for 12 of those 20 years. And so, of course, I'm a gentrification vet. Um, I lived in a neighborhood that the real estate people um, called Clinton Hill. They made that up. It was really a part of bed I didn't know that, so I went to go vote for Dinkins when I was 18, and I was like, the lady was like, where do you live, baby? I was like, I live in Clinton Hill. She was like, ain't no such thing. <laughs> but right now they call um, Bushwick East Williamsburg. So I've seen this you know, happen, I've seen, um, and, and one of the ways that my realtor got me to my apartment was I took the G train, and by taking the G train, I was able to avoid Fulton Avenue. Um, until, of course, I lived there and I realized that the C train was the train, the easier train, the G train freaking sucks. Um, and so when you come to Detroit, just to answer that question about having been here eight hours, I mean, clearly stay on your track and enjoy the city, but go outside of, I mean, I think that's the first thing. It's to go, and I don't have answers. I'm happy that after decades of a complete separation um, in terms of the racism and the, the suburbs and the the city, that some of that has begun to melt. The, the guy who asked, he's from Chicago. Um, I mean, it would be an inversion of your city, you know. People who live on the south side of Chicago have to take three hours worth of buses just to get to fast food jobs. You know, so we don't, we don't, we're not powerless, you know, in, this, in the city in the way that black people in Chicago are in terms of this utter separation and racism of your city. But we are, we've always been surrounded it's always been like a donut, you know, and the empty in the middle, that whole thing. And we'll talk more about that, because you can't get around talking about gentrification and race when you talk about Detroit. You just can't. Um, but progress is being made. You know, I, I love that she's here from the Eastern Market. A lot of progress is being made over food. <laughs> I mean, the way that I got to see South Side of Chicago was that Charles's chicken thing or whatever, you know? Um, so certainly, come into the neighborhood and eat. You know, there, there's a way that people are showing you Detroit in the way that my realtor showed me that Brooklyn apartment, where you just stay in this area. They've renamed um, Cass Corridor Midtown. Um, and you stay along this Woodward Corridor that abruptly cuts off at the Boston Edison District. Um, and, and you don't see the rest of the city. Now, and, and again, it's not about you know being all militant about it. I'm a lifelong Detroiter, but guess what? After my dad died, I moved my mom to Gross Point because it's safer there. She's a single woman now, and if the if the ambulance doesn't come in 29 minutes for 29 minutes when you tell them that your husband's having a heart attack, um, you can imagine how long it takes the police to come. Um, and I don't necessarily believe in an increased police presence, but you're certainly going to be nice and safe in this area because it you know. They decided, just as they have in Harlem, for instance, where they're trying to flip that neighborhood in terms of gentrification, they've occupied it with the police so that you have a police state to make way for gentrification. What Giuliani did citywide, they, we continue to use this model. We don't want that model in Detroit. Um, That's right. And, you know, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs>
we still have this slave mentality about expecting somebody to give us a grant, which is a new form of change. Because then we have to modify the program to fit their needs. Right? If I'm rescuing them, I'm wrong. Because if I am, I won't be helping. <laughs> so we really need to understand that things like this, events like this, and conversations like this are about us doing things for ourselves. And if the only people, if the Calvary ain't coming over the hill, we are the Calvary. All right? So we can argue about gentrification, we can argue about institutional racism, we can argue about not getting paid. But we can't argue about our own passion of making what we want to happen, happen. That's only our, if we don't do it, it is only ours that we receive the blame. Making sense? Yeah. 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 Your challenge. Right, right, right. So my issue is when I talk <laughs> when we talk about gentrification in particular, these are people who are utilizing our community that we pay tax dollars for, that we sacrifice for. Hold on. It's our land, it's our home, it's our city. And so when you have certain areas where the government is complicit with these foundations to support certain uh, art, certain artists, certain programs, no offense, certain programs that don't fit benefit the majority of the people who have the ones who are bearing the weight of that. I'm not talking about just foundations. I'm talking about the politics of it. And I'm always for self-determination. But in the midst of self-determination, you're not going to do it on my back. You're not going to do it on the city where I pay taxes. You're not going to do it where we have lived for all of our lives to bring people who come from outside to come and live in places where they don't pay taxes, but they drain the resources, but you drain us to take care of them. That's what's happening here in Detroit. We have areas where they call them empowerment zones, where you have people who come in here with $150,000, $350,000 loss, and they barely pay taxes. But you will tax us on our homes that we've had for 40 years plus to the point where we're struggling to maintain them with little services. But those areas who pay little taxes get more services, and then we call that progress. That's not correct. Did you fight that? Did you fight That's that? what we're doing. Did you, did you fight that? You do not also ask, ask them to support what you're doing. Nobody said that. that. Nobody said that. Did you fight that? I, I didn't hear anybody say All we right. needed them to save us. That was my point all along. We don't need you to save us. If you want to be a part of it, work with us. That's my constant thing, self-determination. That's right. So I think, like, to that, um, both both gentlemen and, and your comments, you know, I think, um, you know, what I would like to say and what my question, I guess, is and how to help, you know, solve some of these issues is that if, if the city has a, a plethora of dormant assets, uh, property, vacant land, homes, things that need to be fixed that they're not fixing or taking care of, if the people who are spending their time and energy um, on those places to revitalize them, is there a way for us to figure out an equity model so that they can earn uh, that property, earn that space that they're uh, that they're actively pursuing? You know, uh, artists who are painting, you know, doors on, you know, to board up houses or whatever. No one's paying them to do that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're doing it on their own. So why not put that time and energy towards uh, the spaces that you know you, you care so much about? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where do you go? It's like, you know, okay, this is good. Hi, I'm Nia My born name is Latrice, so that's very Detroit for those people who <laughs> live here. And I own that, and I own E2 Day. And um, I, uh, I, I've, been, I've been living outside of Detroit for about 20 years, and um, we, we kind of had some, some of the same real estate. I, I was in Clinton Hill, um, New York, uh, and I'm in Long Beach, California, doing performance art. And uh, I, I'm really proud of this city. I'm proud of this space and this opportunity right now. And wow, don't you, feel, you just feel it, you know, race. 
gentrification. You can't escape these kind of conversations in America, in any city, right, where we have power, right? We're really talking about power and who holds it and who gets to determine and make decisions for people. And land, power and land. I'm really interested in hearing, and sorry for my back to these amazing um, people. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about what our thinking is about power and land in the spaces where we all live. You all, everybody's having this conversation. Everybody, shake your head if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, but we, we, so we can't escape it, but at the same time, be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. We can't, we're not, we're not running away from it. We're, I feel like we're, we're confronting it. The issue that I'm hearing is that, you know, who has access to some of these conversations? How do you talk about people, you know, and about empowering a people and they're not in the same room? And when, so when we go to our organizations, when we do our thing, when we do our art, we want to, you know, we, you know, we can't do it, like she says, we can't do it for folks. You know, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing what kind of, mm, like, egalitarian relationships um, are people building where uh, folks are actually, they have power to, um, you know, get their own thing done, whether it be housing, whether it be uh, jobs or economics. You know, I have four uncles who are in their 60s, who are off and have been off for about 20 years, all with disability, um, from uh, working in the factories. And I heard something mentioned about um, post-factory something, I'm not sure. Post, yeah. And I'm saying, um, you know, where are we, you know, these are people's lives. You know, this is, this is almost like walking into uh, apartheid. Right, in, in, in South Africa, that's why I feel the tension is thick. You know, just because it's America, it doesn't mean that it's, it's thick. Race is, what did, what did Malcolm say? Anything below uh, the, 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 anything below Canada is the South. <laughs> <laughs> and it, those are hard conversations, and especially for artists, but I'm saying, who's having success? You know, who, where, where people who are normally disenfranchised, you know, really um, able to sustain themselves on their own because, you know, some of us have a critique of the not-for-profit industrial complex and we're trying to figure out ways that we can, we can, we can sustain ourselves with our own money in our own communities, you know, and with our artists, folk, and, you know, not have our communities not necessarily be taken over but preserved, you know, for our elders and for generations that are com to come. Who's got success, success stories? Thank you. Response to what? Well, success stories about, about so you're talking about film? No. Well, for instance, working with the garden with the children and getting sure. incentives to get them involved in. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so that, that's one kind of micro example, sure. Um, so, in that particular project, for those that weren't in the, in the room then, um, essentially what's happening is uh, we, so this film after the factory, we took, we did a screening one night at the main art theater in Royal Oak. Um, and took all the proceeds from that and have used it, used that money to build a remote control race car track uh, on a vacant lot uh, next to the Georgia Street Community Garden uh, that's run by a fellow named uh, Mark Covington. And the idea with this race track, I mean, in and of itself, it, it sounds kind of silly, but the idea is that it gives uh, kids and, and I guess, adults too, uh, it gives people a, a fun place to go. Yeah. Um, with the idea that it's just fun in and of itself. And in doing so, in order to earn car time, um, they, they, will, they will work alongside Mark in the garden. 
um, in a variety of different ways. So they can volunteer um, and help him with one of his reading nights, or um, they, can, they can help with a, a, a movie night, or they can help pick turnips one day, or they can work in the media center and, and show, kids, show other kids in the neighborhood um, this huge collection of books that exist that, in my opinion, go underutilized. Um, so we're in the very uh, preliminary stages. We've just been working most of the summer uh, to clear off the lot. Uh, because of the, it was a, an old church parking lot um, that has since up and gone. And so it's covered in debris and tires and all this stuff. So we're really just cleaning it off. And then at that point, we're going to bring in a bunch of truckloads of dirt and spread it out to sort of create a track. And then we're actually using um, wood and materials from um, other sort of uh, decaying houses in the area to build the, the deck that the children will stand on, you know, to race the cars. Um, and then, like, we're going to try to take, like, bathtubs and stuff and, like, sink them into the ground where the cars will jump over. So just things like this. I mean, and, and all in, I mean, this is probably going to cost us, uh, you know, two to three thousand dollars. I mean, sure, that's not accounting for the time that it takes, of course, but, um, so, and we're really just moving around with dirt. Um, we're, we're not talking about, um, you know, installing uh, crazy circuitry, things like this. We're talking about moving around dirt and creating a, a functional space for people to exist in. Um, and then the longer term vision down the road, and I, I see May in the eye, so maybe uh, she can hear this and pass the word on to Wayne State. Um, uh, the, the idea, the larger vision is that ideally kids, there will be maybe a handful of kids that are really interested in the cars, you know, themselves. And, so we can bring university programs in to, to teach them, um, you know, things like basic circuitry and, and perhaps an engineering course that sort of relates to this thing so that it sort of, you know, opens their eyes to other possibilities and, and potentially work with local universities to, to try and bridge that gap so that perhaps we can uh, offer some scholarships and things like that. And again, we're starting with dirt. We're talking about hands and dirt. So very, very manageable stuff. Um, so that's, that's one success, I suppose. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can briefly. So one of our success stories has been getting And demand. So we as Eastern Market have joined a group called the Third Community Markets and there's about 13 different food um, access programs, whether it's uh, smaller neighborhood farmers markets, whether it is a farm stand where you have pop-up mobile uh, farmers markets, uh, you have uh, food trucks, you have CSA style box uh, delivery programs, um, and we have created a network. And it's a really great thing to know that throughout the city of Detroit, if you go to one, you will find about other people who are working on the same problem as you. And we share resources. A lot of it is grants from foundations, and, but also from uh, other different uh, sources like uh, you know, federal grants and so on. And we try to redistribute it so that if some people need help with grassroots marketing campaigns, that's where the money goes. If some people need help with uh, special events programming, that's where the money goes for them. So um, it doesn't seem like such a such a big accomplishment, but two years ago, none of these none of these markets really worked collectively. And just seeing how much work and effort went into it, we have a website, we have uh, ads on uh, two different radio stations, we have flyers, we have posters, we have people talking about it. It's really exciting. So eat fresh. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So I know that we're gonna we're gonna transition here, but I just want to thank everybody tonight for, for participating in the conversation. I know it's there's been some it's been clearly some some tension, but I think that it's been it's been really good. And as I mentioned coming out of the presentations. These are conversations that we don't typically have in the same space. And I think the more that we can have them, the more that we can kind of get on the same page and identify those successes and actually work collaboratively together. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. For being here. Thank you so much for all that you have just shared. Come on. Um, so, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, just really quickly. Uh, this was, uh, thank you. Uh, I, it's just uh, important that, uh, that we, the conversations that we have and the dialoguing, being next to one another is, uh, is always uh, an important thing. Um, I'm reminded I was talking with this woman, uh, uh, um, Shay Howell. Uh, we did this yeah, and um, she talked about going back to something that was earlier about the need to acknowledge that before we were here, a lot of people were doing this work that allowed us to even like be, 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 me to be here, you know, and and naming that, like acknowledging that other people can sacrifice a lot is is just uh, an important thing. So I just kind of want to take this minute to just. Acknowledge that, that we are here because a lot of people that came before us um, gave up a whole lot and did a whole lot. And so, just take that moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, speaking of good work, I would like to introduce Elise Germack. Come on. So, uh, this is Elise's space that she has been very generous in working with us on over the past couple of days. Um, and she is part of the Eastern Market community. Um, and she's going to tell you just a little bit about this. And you have to know this woman has been saving our ass right and left today. <laughs> so, just right there, giving her some gratitude for like, everything we've done. So, tell us a little bit about this. I feel like this space was made for this event because really our family is all about using art as a tool for building communities. And um, this space was my husband's um, nut manufacturing facility. So right where the cash drive is, there was a huge conveyor belt coming down where the nuts would, as they were packaged, would come and be shipped out of the roll-up door and um, for over a decade after we moved up the street to a more modern facility that was all on one level, we tried to lease the space out 
uh, it was too big, it was too overwhelming for people. And then, you know, in our travels going to Fulton Street Market in Chicago and the distillery district in Toronto and Chelsea in New York, we just realized that the Easter Market could be the same thing. Art living with specialty food, living with a walkable community. And really almost overnight, we popped up as an art gallery and it's been almost two years. And it's been the most fulfilling experience in my life. Oh. And um, I thank you for being here. We rent the space out for special events. Uh, every six weeks we usually have rotating art exhibits. There's usually art all over the walls in here. And um, it's just really a joy to have you all in this space, using it and enjoying the market. Thank you. So just so you know, she did not mention is that frequently the art that is here is of Detroit artists. So she's extremely focused on like who is the art and where the art is in the community and featuring that work. And I encourage you to talk to her about the history of this space. And if you're an artist, maybe talk to her. So, uh, there are two people I left off my special thank you list earlier, and I just have to give some serious props to Oya and to Lana, if they are still in the house. Those two women, when I've said, I need somebody for this, or I need this, have been at my, um, they've just been so accessible and generous in offering time and energy and resources, and I cannot thank you enough for, for coming forward tonight, and so I appreciate all of you doing um, we're gonna take a little. We're gonna take like a 20 minute break. There uh, is gonna be a ladies' performance set yeah. of some really fast.